What's up, everybody? This is Soren Baker on the Soren Baker Show. Thank you for listening. You know, we're worldwide and we appreciate the support. Um, you know, we talk a lot about music, entertainment, society, politics, etc. with our guests. And, you know, we're excited tonight to have a guest that uh, has a tremendous me- legacy in the music game and has done way more than I think people realize or appreciate. And that's one of the many reasons that I wanted to bring Kwame in the house tonight. Hey, hey, hey. So Kwame, thank you for coming through here to the Soren Baker Show. Thank you for having me. Yes, man. It's uh, always it's nice a pleasure. nice to be talked to. Yes. <laughs> it's always a pleasure talking with you, Kwame. Yes. So thank you, thank you. Um, everybody, please make sure to also subscribe, share, and rate this show because it's going to be a great one, I hope and I imagine, because uh had a lot of good conversations with Kwame over the years and uh that's what we're getting into now so uh Kwame yes one of the many things that I thought was very interesting about your career as it started uh to my knowledge at least your professional career that side of it was the fact that you came into the game as a rapper producer at a time when that really wasn't the norm yeah yeah um you know, coming out really in 89 uh, with the Boy Genius album. So what what made it to where you were so musically inclined to want to pursue both rapping and producing? Um, To be honest with you, I thought that's what you had to do. Mm, okay. um, and it didn't, you know, rap for me as a kid, it was like a, a it was like a mystical thing, mm-hmm. you know. I'm I'm talking about. I remember hearing Rapper's Delight for the first time. I remember exactly what I was doing. I remember exactly where I was. And well, break it from, down. Where were you? You know, I was five, six years old, mm-hmm. um, playing with Star Wars figures <laughs> on the floor with my with one of my good friends. His name is Dakar Calendar, and we were playing with the Star Wars figures, and our mothers were in in another room, and the station, the New York City station at the time, um, which doesn't even play anything near hip hop. It was a station called ninety two KTU, mm. and um, or it, either KTU or WBLS, one of the two stations, the premier stations in New York City at the time. And Rappers Delight came on, and I clearly remember, like, yo, what is this? Mm-hmm. Because the, the stations at the time, they played, if it was quote-unquote funky, they played it. Mm-hmm. So you would go from, I don't know, anything. It could be uh, whatever, Michael Jackson off the wall, because I'm, I'm taking it for, to that 1979 time. So right. Michael Jackson off the wall would come on, and then I remember John Lennon had a record called Starting Over, and then mm-hmm. Starting Over would come on, and then uh, a James Brown record would come on, and then... All of a sudden, Rapper's Delight came on. And you're like, yo, what? <laughs> but right. they were also playing Sheik's Good Times. So you would hear, so you're like, what are these guys doing over Good Times? Did they play them back to back when nah, you heard I don't, it? I don't really remember that. You okay. know, because like I said, I'm five, six, so your memories are, are scattered. But I was very in tune to music. It, it was in my household, my father played modern jazz a lot, my mother played. A lot of Stevie Wonder, a lot of, a lot of Motown, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of that adult contemporary R and B that was mm-hmm. going on. And then in my grandmother's house, which I was always at, she would play a lot of whatever the pop music would be at the time. So I'm hearing a lot of Billy Joel. I'm hearing a lot of like again Stevie Wonder. I'm hearing mm-hmm. the Beatles. I'm hearing. I'm hearing everything. So. So um, when Rapper's Delight comes on, I'm I'm mesmerized because I'm like, wait, I can I can talk just like them. I can sing along with them, you know, and and <laughs> right. it actually makes sense. And then it was like it was like a three punch. It was Rapper's Delight, Freedom, Sugar, I mean Furious Five, yeah. and The Breaks, Curtis Blow. Mm. It was a rap from that point. You know, you couldn't tell me I wasn't Melly Mel. You couldn't tell me it wasn't Curtis Blow. You know, I wasn't Wonder Mike. I was, you know, those these <laughs> records shaped me immediately to the point where 
I remember getting freedom for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And my cousin, who was basically like my brother, got Rapper's Delight. Okay. And this is how the importance of label association. I'm like, wait, why does this record look just like that record? Sugar, Sugar Hill. Hill. Yeah. Like, what is that? So from that point on, every weekend, Dad, I need to, I need to go to the record store. Mm -hmm. If it said Sugar Hill, I'm buying it. Mm. You know, I asked my you know parents, I need to buy this, I need to buy this. And then from there, I don't know how, I think some friends or whatever, I had a cousin, an older cousin, and she had all the rap records. So I would always see Sugar Hill or Enjoy. Mm. Okay. So then it turned into, okay, anything that has Enjoy on it, anything <laughs> that has Sugar Hill records, I need it. So I was just buying everything, everything. I had to run it, you know, run it past my parents and everything, but they were buying it for me. And, and from along with Star Wars figures on one end and Sugar Hill records on the other end, that's how, you know, that's how the whole thing started. So back to your question, because I can get long-winded. It's um, all good. At the same time, um, I was heavily into Stevie Wonder and I was heavily into Prince. Mm -hmm. So um, now I'm 13, 14, and I'm buying Prince albums. I have all the Stevie Wonder albums. Um, actually, my my aunts were cool with, with, with his family members, so I, I, we had a lot of Stevie Wonder stuff in the house. Uh, and... Now I'm into liner notes. You know, it's, it's it's serious for me. So when I look at Stevie and I look at Prince, it always said written, produced, composed, and arranged by Prince. Right. Stevie Wonder. That's all. Oh, I guess that's what you got to do. Mm -hmm. I okay. never thought that there was some guy that came in and wrote the song and produced the song. And, you know, I, I'm like every artist that I hear on the radio, they're writing and they're doing everything. Right. It's just that these two guys are better than the rest of these guys. Are, in well, my mind. they were better than a lot of them. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, and then it turned into other people. Then it's like, okay, well, Billy Joel does that. Oh, for real? Um, you know, it, it just, I started paying attention to the people who did that. Or then I started paying attention to songwriters and producers. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew who, Burt Bacharach and Carol Bayer Sager was at 12 years old. You know, things like that. Quincy Jones and Sir George Martin with the Beatles. I started really like, okay, I didn't know how they did it. I just knew that it was done. Mm -hmm. So um, skipping around, and you know, there's other pieces in between, but skipping around, flash forward to me. Um you know, I was exposed to Herbie Lovebug and seeing him make beats and seeing him write and produce for Salt and Pepper as a school project, not even right. making a record. Right. <laughs> you know Yeah, people forget that part of yeah. it. Seeing that firsthand is like and then Herbie disappearing for literally a summer. Mm-hmm. And just to give you the picture, the beginning of the year, Herbie was driving around a uh, orange 1978 or 79 Datsun. Okay. That was held together by duct tape. Mm -hmm. No lie, no exaggeration. Okay. He put out Super Nature, now known as Salt and Pepper. Right. right. As you know, as a diss to the show and the and showstopper, it, yeah. And <laughs> and you didn't wasn't think I wasn't thinking about it at thirteen. Mm -hmm. I just know he disappeared. Okay, for a whole summer, and you had no idea what happened. To no him. idea what happened. Okay, he comes back home with a red one ninety e Benz. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big upgrade. All these fat ropes on mm -hmm. leather jackets because it's the winter time now. Mm -hmm leather jackets, gold teeth. Mind you, none of this stuff, you know, it, it's it's amazing to a kid. Right. And I'm like, Herbie, what happened? What did you do? Mm -hmm. 
And he just looked at me and he said, hey, man, I'm a producer. And from that exact second. You were a producer, too. I was a producer. I was like, oh, hey, that's what it takes. I need a car. I'm going to be a producer. So, you know, he put he defined. That he put a title on it, mm-hmm. you know. Certain certain things, certain slick Rick put a de- a de- definition of a a personal definition of an MC to me. Okay. And per- and Herbie was my personal definition of a producer, and I'm like, and then I knew that Rick was doing his beats. And mm-hmm. stuff like that as well. I'm like, oh well, hey, this, I, I guess that's what you got to do. Well, one of your one of the interesting things is one of your far down the line collaborators um, that you had worked with LL Cool J was mm-hmm. actually producing a lot of records or co-producing a lot of records that yeah. people didn't realize. The Walking with the Panther, even the Bigger and Deffer, like yeah, he yeah, yeah. co-produced those records too, and yeah, that I was never, unusual. Yeah, I would have never known Rick. Um, LL, Kane, a KRS lot of one. yeah, KRS, <laughs> EPMD. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm not paying attention to that at the time. You know, and then, you know, L, working with L, he let me know. Yeah, I, I put this record together. I put that record together. Same with Kane. You know, you know, just people just talking, having producer talk, right? And it would just be you would not, you would have never thought that that's what. Um, that's what was going on, you know, because because then after a while, hip hop was just known for okay, this is your producer, right? <laughs> and you're the rapper, or your DJ is your producer, and you know it was all it started to get all compartmentalized and and stuff like that. So how did the working with Herbie, um, the actual production of the Boy Genius album happen in the sense that? I've heard different things, but I've never asked you directly, like, what did you do? What did Herbie do? What did the Invincibles do? Like, what was going on? Well, the Invincible, well, to clarify, um, the Boy Genius got made. Uh, I've told I've, I've told the story in, in different ways, but mm-hmm. basically um, Herbie's little brother, Steve, he had a girlfriend at the time whose mother was sort of kind of like in the industry or whatever. And she, everybody knew that I rapped. Everybody knew that I made music. I played drums. I played keys and stuff. So I was just known in the neighborhood for doing all that kind of stuff. And, and Georgette's mom was like, well, there's a building in Queens called the Music Building. Mm. And there's a bunch of studios in there, and you can, you can make a demo. I was like, well, for real? Because I'm sitting around waiting for Herbie to let me make a demo, and, you know, he's busy. Being he's a the producer. only guy I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's being a producer. Yes. And um, so I go to the music building, and I make one demo. There's a song called She's Not Just Another Woman. It was based off of a sample of the same name. Mm-hmm. It was terrible. <laughs> so I bring it to Herbie. And Herbie's like, this shit is whack. I just wanted his opinion, and I wanted him to produce me, mm-hmm. for you know because he was the hot producer, and I just thought it was just super cool. And then I went back to another another studio within the building, and the person who ran the studio and the engineer was the late and great producer engineer Paul C. Mm-hmm. And Paul. And I did not know, you know, Paul was behind some records that I was loving, like Super Love of Sea, Casting right. Over Road. Those Girls records, like I got them locked. <laughs> yeah, I, I I didn't even know it was the same guy. Okay. So Paul was like, you know, he was just looking at me like, all right, kid, how much money you have? And I said, well, this is how much I have. He said, look, I'll give you time from midnight to 8 a.m. Christmas morning. All right. So, so... Christmas 1987, you know, going, you know, from midnight to 8, 8 a.m., I had that eight hours to figure it out. Okay. So I knew what records I wanted to sample. I knew I had all rhymes in my head already, you know, and, and, um, 
I asked Paul to show me my way around the SP 1200. Mm -hmm. I made the beats, so I made the rhythm. I made um, another song on the album, The Mic Is Mine. I made pretty much, I made, the album has eight cuts. I made six of the eight cuts that night. Wow. And um, because I was like, this is all I got. My only time, my only shot. I'm not, you know, I'm working at a a C-Town grocery store and I saved up literally for the whole year almost to Mm -hmm. get this eight hours. Um, And I had some friends that chipped in $20 here, $10 here. So, you know, we, we all made it work. And um, I just remember riding the bus home at eight o'clock in the morning from one part of Queens going to the other part of Queens. Like, man, yo, we just pretty much made an album, man. I was super hyped. 15 going on 16 and um and I remember playing it for Herbie now to give you like um and at uh, this point we have to explain that Herbie has had hits with what Dana Dana yeah, at the Dana time already uh Salt Salt and Pepper, Pepper's blowing up yes yeah, so, I mean Herbie and, and, is like one of the biggest producers in rap yeah. and arguably getting into just music general. Yeah. Definitely black music, but yeah. overall music period. And, is and one of the, the biggest. thing is what people don't understand about the connection with between me and Herbie, long story short, we lived in a I I call it the most magical neighborhood because we had so <laughs> many people within a one mile radius of us. Salt and Pepper, Kid and Play, right. Cool G Rap, Eric B, Herbie Lovebug, um, myself and so Herbie's little brother, Steve, we all went to this Catholic school called um, St. Gabriel's. Okay. So Herbie is considerably older than me, but Steve is one grade ahead. But we all were, the sm- school was so small, you just know, knew each other. And Herbie was the DJ to my eighth grade prom. <laughs> I met Salt because I thought she was my age, because Salt was like real short. And we all was conspiring to get Salt's number at the eighth grade prom. As so, you should. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is pre-Salt and Pepper. You know, so mm. the and, and they Herbie and his crew, um, the Turnout Brothers, and then they had another crew, um, Super Lovers, which had play in one group and Turnout Brothers had kid in the other, or it was the other way around. Um, they were like neighborhood heroes. Uh, and so... It it was extremely easy access to Herbie. He literally lived two blocks away from me. Mm-hmm. So I would go to Herbie's house. I would sneak out. I would walk, act like I was walking my dog, go to Herbie's house, sit in on a session, let him hear the tape. Um, at the same time, my parents got divorced, and my father was about to remarry and moved out to Inglewood, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. So my grandmother is still in East Elmhurst, Queens, where Herbie and everybody is. So I would be there. But then during the week, I would spend time in Inglewood. And while I was in Inglewood, uh, I'm saying all this and not answering your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Um, it's very interesting. <laughs> while I was in Inglewood, I... With an E, right? Yes. Yes. Not I the became, I out here in L.A. It's different. Best friends. I became best friends with Redhead Kingpin. He lived Pump it, hottie. up the block from me. <laughs> so he was like, if you're if you're a parent and you move to a new neighborhood and you don't want your kids to get involved with the wrong kids, mm-hmm. that was the wrong kid. Because <laughs> we were the devil, man. Like, so <laughs> we he was into rap. I was into rap. I had this demo in hand, and he said, I'm going to introduce you to somebody. I'm getting a deal with Sylvia Robinson, who also lived in the neighborhood. Sugar Hill Records. Back to Sugar Hill Records. There you go. So I'm, like, freaking out almost. So it's weird because I go to Sylvia's house with Red, and it's like a, you know the Magnum P.I. Ferrari? <laughs> There's a, that Ferrari's in the driveway, but it's on bricks. So wow. it's some weird, uh, there's a Rolls Royce. Wait, with, it was on bricks, but it had the tires still? No, it was no oh. tires and it was oh. on bricks. Okay. And then there was a Rolls Royce with flat tires, just in the back collecting dust. Just I'm like, what the hell? Yeah, that's very bizarre. 
So you go into the house, and the house looks like the, the best way I could describe it in my mind. It looks like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air house from the TV <laughs> show. It it, it kind of looks like that. Okay. So I'm tripping out, and I think like a maid answers the door, <laughs> and we go in, and, and Sylvia's son, kid named Rondo, was in my class. I'm like, wait. You, you've been in my class. He said, yeah, I've been telling my mom about you. We all, because people were passing the demo around. Okay. So people in the neighborhood, like I was getting kind of known in Inglewood and in Queens for this Boy Genius demo. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so she sits us down and Red didn't tell me that he already signed. And she changed the name of the label to Bonami Records. Mm-hmm. And it was three artists, two artists on Bonami Records. It was Redhead Kingpin and a group called New Style, which we all now know as Naughty, Naughty by, by Nature. And I was going to be the third artist. So Sylvia gives me a contract. Mm-hmm. And it was like two pages. Two pages? <laughs> it was two pages. <laughs> okay. You had, that you looked probably like somebody had went into the back room and typed up real quick. Dude, you probably had to have written high school papers longer than that at that yes. point. Yes. <laughs> So this is the first record, well, technically, it's not the first record contract, but it's the first record con- real record contract that I'm seeing, and I'm like, okay. Put it in my book bag, I go. <laughs> then at the same time, my father knew his friend's wife was head of publicity at Sony. Okay. And I did not know that my father gave her the demo. Wow. Good looking pops. So I get a call from her saying, there might be an interest for your record up here. Okay. All right. Cool. So you got a two-page contract and you got Sony interest. Yeah, and then Herbie calls me. Right. Warner Brothers, Atlantic Records, and Epic Records are all interested in your demo. Right. I'm like, oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) All right. That's crazy. So now to answer your question about how much did Herbie do, how much did I do, Mm -hmm. you now know that there's three-fourths of the album is already done. Mm -hmm. And we decide to meet with Sylvia Roan and take that deal. Me thinking that my job is done, maybe Herbie can come in and do the rest. Right. But Herbie was a producer and he was busy and he was on tour and he was doing everything. Doing it big. So after school every day, I had to finish the album. Mm -hmm. So we had we went to this studio in Bayside, Queens at the time, 1988, the most racist place on earth. Like literally (laughs) I would get off the bus and it would be this guy with a mullet and a a muscle car and a beer can. Get out of here, (laughs) niggas. We're running down the street. And it's wow. fucked up saying it, but it was funny as hell. It was just like... <laughs> Doesn't this, sound like it. <laughs> it's like, this has to be... And you're right in Queens. and not even 30 minutes from your home, and and it's, this wow. is still going down. And so, it's the 80s, which yeah. is ridiculous. So we get we go to the, the studio. It's called Bayside Sound, and it was run by um, a, 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 um, my man Dave Eng, who was Chinese, and his parents were just non-English speaking, older Chinese parents. And they let him just take over the whole basement and turn it into a, a studio. Mm. So it would just be funny. It will be down there recording and the old mom would come downstairs screaming on Dave because the music is too loud and she's screaming on him in Chinese. And it was just it was just a very, very uh, great experience. And um, that's where all the classic Herbie Lovebug records were made. Every every last one of them were made mm. in this between a place called Power Play and then moved to this home, Bayside Sound. And um, <laughs> every day after school, um, I would take the bus. My mother would pick me up. Um, I would finish the album off and hand records to Herbie and see what he thought. And what I will give Herbie, he he did not have any hand in the creation of any music. Hmm. 
He had no hands in that. He had no hands in the creation of song titles or lyrics or anything like that. Okay. Because at this time, Herbie was so big, and it's not a detriment to Herbie, but people were throwing deals at him. Yeah. And I was one of the deals they threw at him. Hmm. And and um. Well, congratulations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so it was like his work was working for him at the time at this point. And so then, you know, when it was, we had a semblance of an album. It was supposed to be an EP. It's only supposed mm. to be six songs, which I already did. Right. But then I ended up doing three or four more songs. So we talked them into making an eight song album. Right. And Herbie would come in and coach. Hmm. So say, for example, the rhythm, you know, when I rapped the rhythm, it was like I was smooth with it. I came here for something fucking mm-hmm. I was like real happy go lucky. But the original rhythm, I'm like spitting. Well, I came here for something funky to have. You know, it was real like hard. Everything was hardcore. Hmm. And Herbie was like, dude, you got to lighten up. Hmm. So he would just have me say my rhymes over. In a more, different way. More in that happy. In a different pocket. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, keeping the same pocket, but just chilling out. I was just way too much angst, too much like I got to eat them all i was a super lyrical guy okay so if you break down the the lyrics in the boy genius they were very lyrical Mm -hmm. they were just delivered in the non-traditional well i'm glad you brought up your delivery for a few reasons Mm -hmm. and your lyrics because there are two very important things i wanted to ask you about this album in particular from your catalog the delivery one, for only having eight songs, you have a wide array of it. But I also wanted you to get into it. Uh, you closed the album out with kind of the whispery flow. Yeah. So how and why? Because later, of course, Yin Yang and David Banner mm-hmm. got really big with that. And um, I guess you could argue with I'm That Type of Guy, L.L. had it mm-hmm. in in a way. Yep. But yours was very whispery. Yeah. So what? how did that happen I performing and, that song but I'd <laughs> never do that song. Uh, well I've, I was gonna say I've never seen you do it but what um what happened was that one of the first six you did or was that one of the two you no, did that later was the, that was one of the later ones I felt like I felt that an album I felt that an artist should not be one dimensional right and I felt that an album should have records for any occasion mm-hmm and some of this was a Herbie influence in maybe not a good way, and I can explain that in a little minute. <laughs> All right. But when I would listen, I never saw myself. I always saw myself and I saw rap always being a thousand times bigger than what it was. Mm. And it's not a conceited thing or anything like that. I never pictured where some people would picture themselves in 87, 88, 89, rapping at a place like the Union Square or, or something like that. I never pictured that. I pictured stadiums. I pictured Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden. And I right. I rapped about that. Mm-hmm. And and I felt that the only way to possibly achieve that is to be as diverse as possible with your delivery and what you talk about. And where did this visioning come from? Um looking at other artists that weren't rappers. Hmm. So, for example, during that same time, um, Prince had a tour, the Love Sexy tour, and probably to this day, probably the best show I've ever seen in my life, and that was in 87. Okay. And the way this tour was executed, I've never seen it anything like it again. And it was probably and it was probably my first big concert. Um, and seeing what he was doing on stage along with just to, well, to set up the Love Sexy tour, the the stage is a circle and there are multiple points of entry to the stage. Okay. So he comes on stage driving a 67 Thunderbird. He gets out the Thunderbird, starts singing. Then there's a break and then there's like a, off to one side of the circle is like a a, a playground. Hmm. So, He's singing like a door to this girl, one of his background singers, and she's on a swing. And then they go into this music break, 
And then Prince starts playing basketball. And if anybody knows anything about Prince, he was a good basketball player. So he's playing basketball. Shout out Dave Chappelle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he starts playing basketball, and everybody's, like, freaking out. And then in the middle of the stage is, like, a, a, a piano. And then the lights change, and then the piano raises about 100 feet in the air. And it's just him and the piano, 100 feet in the air. And then that lowers. And then this other thing with these horn players on another side is it just it was just so interactive mm -hmm. and it was all encompassing and it, it, it was no front stage and back of the stage anything like that and when i saw that i'm like why can't a rapper do that mm. you know why can't why is why is there only a singer that can do this why can't rappers do this and it you know and i kind of saw it because the first tour that i was on was um nwa that famous no. NWA tour. Right. And PE was on that tour as well. And their set design was crazy, man. It was like, looked like a helicopter was coming down and they looked like they were coming out of sewers and all this stuff. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. And then, or, or knowing about the Fresh Fest tour, that LL Cool J comes out of a radio mm -hmm. and Rock Him comes out of a pyramid. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is what I've been Visualizing. envisioning, not being able to, actually be there because you know i was too young to even get to the fresh fresh tour but, that makes two of us <laughs> but yeah but making these records and doing these different styles i figured this will help me get there mm -hmm. so i can you know i wanted to bring a live band on stage i, I just wanted to do a lot i went to and, and it's things that people do now i remember going to sylvia and saying can i make one long video for every song on the album. Mm -hmm. And Sylvia looking at me like, and literally saying, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Mm. Like, I, I wanted to make a video album, like just tell a long story. And that goes into the second album because the second album was more of a concept story right. album. Kwame has uh, got so much going on, man, with these different stories. And uh, it's just amazing looking back at what inspires and influences people to do different things yeah. and how you saw what was going on in the R&B world and then incrementally happening in the rap world that really affected you. And, and I think that's very interesting. Another thing I thought was always interesting that I always thought was weird because uh, I didn't understand why certain things were happening at the time, but I wanted to get this from you. Because okay. with the song The Boy Genius and with the rhythm, mm -hmm. you talk about being Muslim on those songs. Yes. And... Of course, and this is 89, so like a year or two later with the, you know, conscious movement, you know, we had Rakim mentioning things, we mm -hmm. had Big Daddy Kane mentioning things, but then I think with, uh, of course, the Nation of Islam and the 5%, we saw more of a movement and artists identifying with that. So yeah. why do you think you, uh, who actually talked about it and rapped about it multiple times and even on your biggest song, from the boy genius why do you think that never came to be something that people identified you with asked you about talked to you about or because i didn't i didn't first of all i think nation of islam and five percent nation um i'm trying to find the correct way to say it What's those he? religious Factions um, made, were, were made up of different elements than what I was. My father's a devout Muslim. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and it was weird because I told you I went to Catholic school. So, <laughs> yes, I my father, that was curious. My father was a, <laughs> a devout Muslim, you know, straight Islamic guy. And Is he Shia or Sunni? Sunni. Sunni, excuse me. Sunni. And and so growing up, my mother wasn't, but he never he never tried to push his religious beliefs on anybody. Hmm. Okay. You know, my father is an extremely, 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 extremely religious person. And he never talked against any other religion. Mm -hmm. He actually welcomed all religious conversations 
from any angle. Okay. And he and that's what he taught in the household. So we had a very spiritual household and then he was a very religious man. So myself, my younger brothers, my cousins, we practiced Islam as as much as a Catholic practices the sacrament. It's just it's it was just a way of life. Mm-hmm. So me rapping about it, I wasn't rapping about it for cool points or right. or anything. I was just dropping pieces and bits of what how I was living and subconsciously saying things that I know would have made my father proud. Mm, okay. And the reason why and I won't get in too long into this story, but the reason why is I used to write the most nastiest story rhymes ever <laughs> as a kid. And, and where did that come from? Rick and, oh, okay. and Dana. Um, <laughs> and I used to write these nasty rhymes, and um, my father found one mm, okay. and sat me down in front of my mother and my grandmother and told me to read it to them. Wow. From that point on, I think subconsciously it was like, all right, I need to act and say certain things that will drop some gems in in my father's in my father's head to know that I'm not out here acting crazy. Wilding. <laughs> yeah, I'm not out here wilding on them. <laughs> so, you know, I never really, you know, I never called women out of their names. I never really, I, I never really got down like that because I understood that, for me, I understood there were people looking at me that I wanted to make proud. You know, it, mm-hmm. it sounds corny, you know, in the in the grand scheme of rap, but, um, I think that's where it came from. And I and I never, like I said, I never, you know, like Kane, Rakim, and other other rappers that that were down with like Farrakhan or the or the five percent nation. You know, they would wear like the, the kufis and they would wear the the, the symbols and the, you know, mm-hmm. X Clan and you know Brand Nubian. Of it course. was like it was just like this is, you know, I'm like, I, you know, I try to separate separate church from state, man. It's like, you know, this is what I do, and then, and then I'll talk about getting with this girl in the next line. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 that was it. It just wasn't. And a lot of times, and I can't speak for a lot of people, but a lot of rappers were doing it to be cool. Mm, okay. It wasn't really a way of life. And for me, it was like, this is not anything cool. This is something I know my whole life. And I and I can, I, I bet you, and I think you would know better than me, from what I see, saw in g- going towards your book, mm-hmm. Gangster Rappers, mm-hmm. the most gangsterous rappers I knew mm-hmm. never rapped about being a gangster. Right. They just never talked about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of... Well, I'd say especially outside of Los Angeles, that's yeah. very true. Because, yeah, no, well, uh, I didn't know any yeah, LA guys yet. Yeah, so, so absolutely. like the the killers that I knew that rap, they, oh my God, they'll be talking about girls and dancing and having well, all this good time, and I'm like, okay, see. Well, it, without naming names, I've had multiple dudes from New York, from mm-hmm. your era or earlier, yeah. tell me they wanted to rap about. Other things because they wanted to get away from that. Yeah, exactly. They didn't want to think about it. They didn't want to be around it. They exactly. didn't want to attract that vibe, that crowd, that energy. They were using rap not only to hopefully have a career and a life yeah. and to make money, but they wanted to use it. It was an escape. Escape. Yeah. Professionally too and personally. Yeah. It wasn't like they. Yeah. They were. They've told me multiple times like, why would I <laughs> try to invite myself. invite this to yeah. myself? Yeah. And 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 so back to the religious aspect Mm -hmm. you know I've always you know I'll say little things here and there but then at the same time when people meet me and people associate with me or if they ask what do I want on my my backstage writer or Mm -hmm. what do you want to eat or you know just whatever 
it's just a normal thing. Like, I'm not going to say Islam and then ask for a ham sandwich the next day. I'm just, <laughs> not, it's, I've never done it. Right. I've never had it. I don't know, you know, I don't know what it what it's like. Man, I'm not the card carrying member of of the Islamic faith like, you know, like my father is, but you know, it's just um well, it clearly informed your music cuz I remember as a kid listening to the music and then understanding as I grew and evolved and started understanding more about the world and how things mm-hmm. were working that that it was done in a different way yeah. than, in particular, the Nation of Islam and the 5% Nation of the Gods and the Earth. But yeah. it was also done, it also reflected differently in how you rapped, what you rapped about, mm-hmm. and to me, you yeah. know. Um, because it was very, it was very different. And I also always thought it was interesting that you did on the rhythm say that stuff. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. it wasn't like you were running from it or hiding from it. It's just... For instance, people latched on to the polka dots or they latched on to you being young or they latched on to whatever else, yeah, yeah, yeah. the sleepy eye, whatever yeah, it was, yeah. it was these other things. Yeah. So, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, I think people, there were too many other rappers doing it way more. Right. Oh, absolutely. Than me just mentioning it. And, you know what I'm saying, I would probably mention, I, I don't think in my first album I've ever mentioned a polka dot, ever. <laughs> But yet, <laughs> but yet and still, yet and still, yes. Um, but moving on to the second album, uh, "A Day in the Life of Pokedelic Adventure." The thing, this was also speaking to your creativity, and was it pure? How did the idea to do a concept album that came out in 1990 happen? Because that explicitly wasn't being done, at least in rap, to the magnitude I think that your album did it. I, I don't. You know what? It's so weird. It wasn't a thing where I sat down and said, I'm going to make a concept album. <laughs> okay. I like telling stories. Um, I felt that people didn't really get the boy genius. Mm. And I felt that maybe I needed to switch it up a little bit to make it more digesting. I and this is what I un- also understood. I understood that there was a whole world outside of Queens, New York. Mm. Because of songs like The Man We All Know and Love and The Rhythm and and Sweet Thing. Um those records took me started taking me around the country. Right. And I'm now meeting this kid I met named Ice Cube and I'm like what's the Ice Cube or another kid that I met named Too Short and another kid I met named Easy E and, and then another guy I met Dr. Dr. I'm meeting these guys that I would have never heard of or I'm witnessing how people are reacting to things other than Cool G Rap Rock Him Slick Rick and Big Daddy Kane EPMD or whatever and I'm like okay there's a whole world out here and I think stories that kids my age can poss- possibly relate to um, that's what was just coming out of me at the time um, I still wanted to be lyrical but the influence of Herbie he was beating it in my head that Lyrical rappers will never work. Hmm. He was very into making a crossover rap record. As evidenced yeah. by his output. <laughs> he, you yes. know, the you know, he was saying that Kane will never go anywhere. Rakim will never go anywhere. You know, he was the people that I'm loving, the people that I wanted to be on par with lyrically, mm-hmm. he was just like it's not gonna work. You there's there's a million lyrical tough guys out here. You gotta be this. Mm-hmm. The lighthearted high school kid that likes to have fun and chase girls. And I highly respected Herbie at the time. Um I still do. I still highly respect Herbie. Um Herbie Lovebug is coming to you, Kwame, as you're getting ready and as you're working on your career 
getting in, going into your second and album and everything, and he's telling you that lyrical rappers are not going to last or yeah. they're not going to make it, and you've got to change up your style to be, you know, what you became known for, like yeah. a high school kid chasing girls, yeah, and friendly. You know, and, and and also just on my on my end, I understood that the bigger artists are known for their music and the biggest artists are known for for I guess their personality their look their style mm -hmm. and so um it wasn't like a conscious effort okay everything is going to be polka dots it's not that it was the way I dressed naturally I was not the dapper Dan mm -hmm. fat rope sweatsuit guy I was never that the way I dressed was exactly the way I dressed nobody styled me or anything like that and um, whenever we would do a show, everybody had on polka dots. Mm. Everybody started to emulate literally what started as one shirt, one tie, one pair of socks mm. interchanged in different settings. Okay. You know, the same shirt was a shirt in my first album cover on the back. Mm-hmm. It was the same shirt that was a, a pajama top on the first video. <laughs> you know, it, it just would just get interchanged. And, you know, when I couldn't afford like some, I don't know what was in style at the time, but it, whatever was in style, I couldn't really afford it. I mm -hmm. wasn't getting MCM and Gucci and Fendi or, you know, spending all my money at Dapper Dan. I wasn't, I wasn't going to do that. So where that polka dot shirt almost every day you know right. um i'm 16 years old you know i don't have a budget i don't have things like that my album budget was i got eleven thousand dollars out of the album budget and i bought a volkswagen so <laughs> you know it goes to show you <laughs> where i was at and right. um and because you're a producer you got your car like yeah, herbie yeah I'm there a you go i'm a producer <laughs> congratulations and then it had no top <laughs> so um <laughs> And so when second album comes around, I'm like, okay, let's let's examine everything that people are gravitating to and turn it up. Mm. You know, if people like the polka dots, that's going to be, if Prince had purple and Paisley, I'm going to have polka dots. You know, it was just basically, that was basically it. Mm. And, and using Prince also with the, the Day in the Life album, we saw you changing how you wrote your song titles by putting the words all yeah, together yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, yep. and the funky spellings. Was and that my thing was that was like, okay, I didn't want to have, I didn't want to spell anything like anybody else. It was mm -hmm. just, my thing was, okay, let's go 100% as uh, individual as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, um, cause I remember getting the album and I normally only would glance at the song titles before I listened to it yeah, yeah, yeah. because I didn't want to get any ideas on anything for anybody's album. But yeah. I remember when I looked at it, I remember thinking like, man, they must have messed up at the printer <laughs> or I got a bad copy. Like, uh -huh. yo, what is this? And yeah. then but, and, and that, that was by design. <laughs> it was like, and I remember taking because, I, you know, I do I, I draw it. So I, I drew up the album cover, did the, the, the design. And I remember taking it to the um art director his name is Bob Deferin and he was like uh young man uh, what is this <laughs> I'm like no I need this to be O W N L E E E U E only you I'm like <laughs> what like, just just go with me just go with it and Sylvia you know she's co she said just go with it just go with it at first it was and this is the funny thing it was going to be what we now know as emojis I had symbols everything was just symbols Mm. Like hieroglyphic type symbols, and they were like, "Okay, man." We well, you use hearts and stuff. Yeah, but I went all in, like all numbers, in. symbols. Okay. It was crazy looking, and they're like, "Nah, you're gonna have to tone this down a little bit, man." So, wishing that I knew then what I know now, searchability, but there was no such thing as searchability back then. So I, you know, put this thing together, and it was just about being as far out there as humanly possible mm -hmm. because on one end of the spectrum you have Herbie talking about we got to go pop we got to go pop we got to go pop and then on another end of the spectrum 
I don't want to be forgotten. And I understood that at any given time, you could be forgotten. Mm. So what do you do? Um, and there's a million things I wish I would have done. You know, the the lyrical, harder edge, you know, records that would have complimented the boy genius. There was a bunch of those records made. Mm-hmm. Um, but the concept, the concept thing happened. Also, you get a bunch of 17, 18 year olds in the studio. We were just having fun, man. It was, mm-hmm. no one was thinking about records, like hit records or whatever. It was like these things, some of these things, most of these stories actually happened mm-hmm. the weekend before or the, you know, the the night before or whatever, and you're writing it down and you're coming up with this stuff. And and um I'm exploring how to make tracks with more live instruments and not be so regimented into the MPC sixty and, and at the time that I was using and it was just more, I swear, it was just like the biggest social experiment that I could have ever done at that time. And uh, there's so much about this album that I've always found intriguing, but with There's a Party Going On, mm-hmm. was that, do you think, did that, was that inspired by House Party? Did you inspire House Party? No Oh, no, that was pure something that actually happened. That wasn't even, House Party wasn't even a, th- a thought. Okay. You know, that was inspired by two events. If anybody knows the song, A Party Going On, it gets interrupted um, by my father mm-hmm. at the end of the song. Now, that event, my father would get home. My my school, my the Catholic school that I went to, was literally two blocks from my house. Mm-hmm. We would get out around 2.30. My father would get home at 4.30. So between 2.30 and 4.30, I would get all my friends and go to my basement, pull out some cardboard, and have breakdance battles. All right. Get your linoleum on. Yeah. <laughs> we would go <laughs> crazy. And it was just one day. It was like 20 of us in there playing Just Begun and having these crazy dance battles. Had my equipment. I'm cutting. It was like Beat Street in the basement. Mm. Okay. And my father got home early Yikes. and came downstairs and flipped. So that aspect came from that. Okay. And then there was like another aspect of, you know, sneaking out, going to a party, you know, just typical t- uh, high school teenager stuff. So, you know, putting things together like that. Um, uh, and the, the track was special to me because it was a, the beat I made from a Fatback Band record. I can't remember the name of the record offhand. The first rap group to put out a song. Exactly. In rap history. Shout out to Fatback Band. But Little a known member fact. of the group <laughs> gave me the album. Mm, even better. And he was a friend. He was a friend of the family of one of um, my boys that was in A New Beginning, A Sharp. We used to call him Flip. His name is James Flip, and he was the bass player to the album he's like hey man you need to check this album out this is what we did in 1973 <laughs> and I just remember being amazed by the album and we didn't have any idea of sample clearance or anything so I was like yo I'm gonna make this beat and you're gonna play it for Flip <laughs> that's the only reason why I used it I wanted hmm. Flip to be happy that we used one of his records um, and so a lot of songs came from song concepts and Beat concepts came from personal experiences. Um, And it was just all my friends involved. You know, the beginning was, you know, Tasha that was in the group. She was like a best friend and she was on the answer machine. All, you know, all all of my friends. Mm -hmm. We were just all in there having fun. And then the album was more of a commercial success than the Boy Genius, meaning we got only you took us way more places. It was a big radio song yeah. in Maryland, where it, I'm from. It, it, was, it got on the radio quite a bit. Everywhere, yeah. everywhere, where the rhythm was just like maybe a couple of cities here. You know, mm-hmm. it was it, it did well, but only you took us everywhere. I remember like Will Smith calling me and like, "Yo, man, I'm in Morocco and they're blasting only you," mm. and that freaked me out. I'm like, "For real." 
they playing me in Africa? I would get letters from Africa and all these weird places. And so I so I think that that idea worked. I just don't think that the label and I don't want to be the artist that always blames the label for something. Mm. But I think the concept was bigger than what the label was willing to understand about a rap record. Because at that point, rap was just played at night. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was it was its own little box to it. So that being said, the two additions that on the outside looking in, I always thought were really interesting on the album were Tasha bringing mm-hmm. a female vocalist, which maybe it hinted at, I guess, with the boy genius, but then also Tat Money. Mm-hmm. So what specifically did those two bring to the project, in your opinion, to A Day in the Life? Well, Tasha I had a crush on. She was a I'm singer shocked. that I knew, and I had a crush on her because I thought she looked like Sade. Okay. And I wanted a rap version of Sade. <laughs> <laughs> so I put her in a, I, I put her in a group. And I was going to make this R&B group. But I sucked at R&B production. I can safely say that at the time. So those records weren't coming out too well. Not so anymore, I, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I, add, I added her to the fold. And I wanted, I, I really wanted to put together... I wanted to put together maybe the equivalent of the revolution... Mm. In a rap version, okay. But I wanted to put together all the, all the pieces that make up a good rap record live. Mm. So, for example, I was on tour with Guy, and mm. I would see how Teddy would line up five MPC sixties Max and Apple Apple computers MPC sixties and his keyboards, and literally play the beats that he made, the records, as live as they could possibly be. Mm. It was like the most awesome thing. And I would sit there with him like, hey, man, so you have to do that. And he's looking at me like, get out of here, kid. And I always felt that it was never done with a rap Mm -hmm. project. It was always the turntable, and that was it. And I understand that's hip-hop, but the turntable didn't make these records. Not at all. So why are you only on stage with your with your DJ? Mm-hmm. And you know, and no one. So when I would be on stage, I would borrow bands. Like, uh, well, that goes back to your thing about the vision. Yeah. Um, because to your point, having a band, I always thought it was intriguing that back to Sugar Hill. Yeah. <laughs> That house bands and Curtis Blow, who wasn't on Sugar Hill, he yeah. was on Mercury. But, you know, people, the early rap records had instruments yeah. being played and they were bands. And it wasn't like a few years later, once sampling and the, the drum machines and all these different things came to fruition, we moved away from that almost instantly. Yeah. But the prior to that, it was live instrumentation going on. But, and see, what I started to see was... I can safely say it was music discrimination Hmm. because a punk band would have the same amount of components as a rap record would have. Okay. Maybe, you know, you have your bass, you have your guitar, maybe a guy on keyboards, and then your singer, and your drummer, and your singer. Right, no more than a four or five piece on stage, and they could have the most random punk punk record out, but they're never gonna go on stage singing to their instrumental. <laughs> right, where you have the Sugar Hill Gang, you have the Furious Five, who have platinum records, mm-hmm. but you've never seen them on stage with that band, right? Ever, you know, and they're selling, they're making money, but the clubs and the venues didn't respect rap enough to even have them have that kind of backline at all. Hmm. So you have to just bring your DJ. So here I am on stage with two turntables, maybe my drum machine, a cassette player, and I'm trying to find ways to recreate 
So my thing was, I'm going to put together what a hip hop band could look like, but I'm going to start with the things that people understand. And that's dancers, mm-hmm. singers, hype person, DJ. We'll start filling in the blanks, and hopefully, if the records get bigger, I can bring in. I never felt I never felt there should be a drummer, okay. because rap records were made on drum machines. So I can play the drum machine. I don't need a drummer, but I'm playing. There's keyboards in here. There's guitars in these records. There, you know. There's and we know, see it in the videos. Yeah, yeah. We could put it in the video, but why? Why can't we put it on stage? And um, so, so that was the the reasoning behind um, a new beginning. And at the same time, like every rap show I go to is the same. It's the same thing. It's mm-hmm. the dudes walking back and forth from side to side on the stage. Everybody say ho, right? Yelling. And I'm like, well, all right. <laughs> well, that that brings us nicely to Tat Money. Cause, okay, uh, so Tat, yeah. Now, Tat, I knew. From Steady uh, B. Steady B, of course. Mm-hmm. Philadelphia pioneer and a very underrated artist. If you guys aren't familiar with Steady B, yeah. you may, his biggest song, I would argue, would be either Going Steady, which Tat Money's on, or you could say I'm Serious Remix by KRS-One. Yeah. But my records bring the beat back. Well, I was about to say yeah. his legacy and history goes much deeper and much before that with, um, you know, pop art putting out a lot of the early rap records in, in Philadelphia mm-hmm. and helping launch that city. Yep. And New York yep. because they put out a lot of New York rappers that yep. people don't realize. Yep. That being said, that's how I knew Tab Money. So when I saw not. As we have to remind people, back in this era, there wasn't that much media covering rap. There wasn't all these interviews all the time. So I just, you just, to me, Tab Money just popped up with you. I'm like, wait, Tab Money's from Philly. Yeah. He's from Queens. They're not even like, what What happened? Like, so <laughs> I was like, what? Before my first album came out, I went to Richmond, Virginia with Herbie and Kid and Play for a show. Okay. And Steady B was the opening act. Steady B and Cool C were the opening act. Yep, and um, <laughs> the sh- it was the worst blizzard ever. Okay. So we're stuck in a hotel. First, we're at the venue. There's literally nobody there. Okay. So we f- get to the hotel, and we're all just, nobody knows what to do. And I'm, you know, I'm young and hungry and hype because I got an album coming out in a couple of months. So I have, like, the demo I have the cassette, the um the mock up, the, the the proof, and I have like a um a, 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 I don't know why I brought this with me, but <laughs> like the proof of the album cover. Like it was like in a, a poster form. Okay. So I'm like, hey, yeah, then I got an album coming out and I'm in their room and they're talking these are the first rappers I've met outside of the guys that I yeah, came crew, up with. Yeah. So I'm talking to them and they're just you know, we're all just hanging out and talking and showing them the album playing the album for them and they you know they they're liking the album and I'm talking about how I like bring the beat back and do the feel out and I know all their records and Tat Tat and I just got real cool mm-hmm. and we we kept in touch and my very first show after the records came out was in Philly mm-hmm. so you know I'd call Tat up he'd hang out um and out with that we came three times dope so right. we were like that was like my second little crew I would go to Philly hang out with Tat three times dope and those are my guys and um, my DJ at the time B Flat who has come up with me since fifth grade literally he by the second album Brian just didn't really fit in like that you know hmm. he he wasn't wearing the polka dot outfits. He wasn't. He was like, he was super hardcore, man. You know, Brian, he would stay in the tour bus. He wouldn't hang out with us. He wouldn't party with us. And halfway through recording the album, he was like, I quit. Hmm. Wow. And he quit a week before a major tour. Okay. So I'm like, I don't know any of the DJ. And then he called Tat. Right. And at that time, Tat had a falling out with Steady B. Mm. So I'm like, I know you and Steady aren't rocking like that. You're not going Steady anymore. Um, <laughs> would you come out on this tour? Mm-hmm. 
and he drove up the turnpike and it's been almost 30 years you know it, it right. we've 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 stuck together and you know Brian went on to um he formed his own group called the 5th platoon and they put mm-hmm. out a record called a party line that was on the the ninja turtle soundtrack mm-hmm. you know and they just want you know Brian wanted to do his own thing and they just never you know he just went his way you know he he wanted to get down with his brothers and they just had more of a more of a they stuck to that original sound that was in on the boy genius you know cuz Brian was you know he was a part of my my crew that supported that type of stuff so i here i am going over here and and Brian is like nah man y'all y'all getting too soft for me we got to we got to keep it hard and lyrical over here so so you know um rest in peace Brian um mm-hmm. but um yeah that's how how um tat got into the fold all right so tat money is in the fold and you're doing extremely well but then yeah a lot of different things going on and now you know over the years you've established yourself much more as a producer and you've had tremendous success with that and of the recent things that you've been doing that's high profile is uh your work with vivian green Mm -hmm. so with her how and why is she a good match for what you're doing now um, with Vivian, I've always had bad luck trying to produce and develop female artists. I don't know why. I'm not the producer guy that, you know, you know, sleeps with them and then puts them out. And that I'm, I was never that guy. That being said, I think it's also important we should tell people, you know, you you work with Tweet, you work with JoJo, you work with Mary, you work with all these huge... uh, But I never developed them. No, you never developed them, and you didn't develop Vivian either. Yeah. But I think it's important to let people know, in case they weren't aware of that, that you've had big songs, hit records, and huge records that were singles with some of the biggest artists in the R&B world, especially. Yeah. Now back to Vivian. So Vivian... (laughs) A mutual uh, artist that I was producing knew Viv and thought that we would be a good match. So she introduced us and Vivian hit me with the, well, I'm already done with my album, so (laughs) I don't need any beats. So I just left it alone. And then she hit me about a year later and was like, "Um, I'm looking for new music. So I sent her this music. And she was like, look, man, I can't, I can't sing to this. It's too hard. It's too hip hoppy. It's too whatever. And I think if anybody knows about Vivian's music, it's very mellow, R&B, sad girl type music. <laughs> and and um, I was not trying to make that mm-hmm. in any way, shape or form. So I don't know how my speech worked. But I was like, look, I just, you know, let's just try some songs. Let's just try another kind of energy. Let's make a record that a DJ is going to want to play regardless of who the artist is. So we made this record called Get Right Back to My Baby. Mm-hmm. And dude, she had no deal. I had no deal, nothing. And I sent it to She didn't know it. I sent it to all these DJs and they all started playing it. Hmm. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> I just was getting opinions. I didn't think it was, I just thought it was like some leak leak record because it had a, a Frankie Beverly sample. Mm-hmm. And um, at that point, I started actively pursuing a production deal. And the way the record was bubbling it helped me get a, a deal with um, Caroline Distribution through Capitol mm-hmm. Records. Um, and the thing about working with Vivian, for the first time in my pro- production career, I don't know how to say it without not trying to sound mean. <laughs> okay. But I have a terrible time in the studio with her. 
It's mm. never fun. It's not good. Mm. We admit to, we admit to this. I'm not mm-hmm. saying anything that she would not say. Right. We fight. We argue. I storm out. I've never. I've, that is not my demeanor. But she's the first artist that challenged me to be a better producer. Mm. Where every other artist that I've ever worked with liked the beat, wrote to the beat or got the beat written to, and, you know, I'll go in there and I'll fix it up and, I, you know, I, I, I coach them along and I do my job as a producer. But it was a very, like, in and out thing where with Vivian's records... She'll be like, I'm not writing to this beat. Okay. But you're a writer, so you write to the beat. I'm like, well, I don't, I'm not an R&B writer. Yes, you are. You wrote, you've written this record, that record, this record. You write the song. Where another artist would never ask me to do that. Hmm. And then I write the song, and then the song comes out dope. And then, you know, so we've had, we've put out four singles already, three out of four with top ten, you know, R&B in, in its perspective. Um in its respective uh, category, top 10 records. And um, it seems to work, mm-hmm. you know. And then on top of that, um, you know, it's just, it, it, that's the best way to put it. It just it just seems to work. It's, trust me, I'm making a new Vivian Green album now. And it's, oh my God. It's well, I'm, like I'm definitely looking forward to dogs, it. Cats and dogs, man, I swear. <laughs> and this will be your guys' third project together. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, Kwame, man, it's been an honor having you in, and we're going to we got to get you back for part two, three, four, five, Yo, whatever, any, man. Yo, any time, man. I got, I got a million of these stories. I know, I and know. And I didn't make any of it up. <laughs> it's even better. Yeah, but so, Kwame, how can people find you online, social media and such? Though I hate social media, yeah, I have to put that, Disclaimer caveat out. on there you can find me on instagram the most and that's kwame vision and facebook what is facebook it's just kwame mm-hmm. or kwame the boy genius one of those they'll find you and twitter is kwame did it d-i-d-i-t i i was you know i got i jumped into these different realms at different times and never was smart enough to say they should all be named the same thing. Never <laughs> knowing that one company would buy the other company and right. you know they would all interact at some point. Um, but I'm probably the most present on Instagram. I'm a very visual person. So yes, and you have uh, you show off nice uh, of your toy collection. Yeah, among, I'm a toy among collector, so. Many other things. Yeah. Well, there it is, y'all. I'm Soren Baker. Thank you for listening. Be sure to. You know, subscribe, rate the show, share it with your friends, download it, et cetera, on your platform of choice. We appreciate it, man. And thank you, special thank you to Kwame for coming through tonight for the Soren Baker Show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. It's an honor, man. And we'll catch y'all next time. Thanks.